Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Architectural Science uh, Collaborative Exercise of 2022. Um, I wanted to just say a few words as the chair of the department. My name is uh, Mark Bogolevsky to introduce the event, and then I'm going to hand it over to uh, the various instructors that worked on various parts of the uh, event. So the, the 2022 Collaborative Exercise is a four-day charrette for those of you that weren't involved. Uh, which brought together over 300 undergraduate students, uh, plus some graduate students, instructors uh, um, from the department and visiting instructors and friends uh, to come and work on 10 different competitions. So these are all international architectural competitions open for students and others to participate in. Uh, and students were organized in groups and teams of uh, between three and six students to work on these various competitions and to, uh, um, to respond to the various different issues that the different competitions address. Uh, and the objective of this whole event is really a, a, a four day fun event to launch the winter term to, to get students working in a collaborative way across the different year groups. So we, the teams are all mixed in different year groups and uh, to prepare a design response to some sort of relevant issue to uh, the, the architectural world today. Uh, the result of this is that uh, we have this online exhibition uh, that we're opening today. We also encourage all the students and all of you who participated in the, in the events, uh, we, we hope that you will submit your work to the various competitions. Uh, we are able to fund any uh, fees that are required to pay for these competitions, so please think about submitting and uh, uh, if you would like to, then please contact myself and Vince uh, who coordinated uh, the event. Um, as I mentioned, because we had uh, 10 events, we had a lot of fa faculty helping out and others from outside the department. So I'd like to thank everybody for their contribution to the event, to, to the success of the event, um, because uh, it needs a, a lot of involvement and a lot of uh, support for various people to make this happen. Um, I hope the students found it uh, productive and found it rewarding to work on these various competitions. The objective was to allow you, the students, to choose the type of competition that you wanted to participate in and have a range of different options so that uh, different uh, so that all the students could explore some of these different ideas that uh, you are interested in so we we hope that that gave you um, an interesting experience and allowed you to uh, explore different ideas and work with different instructors who you may not have worked with in the past uh, this is an annual event that we run and sometimes we've done competitions but we've also done other uh, other activities and worked with other community groups uh, and uh, we produce uh, in the last few years we produced these um, digital exhibitions uh, in the past we've also produced publications that have come out of this event uh, and other output sometimes even pre uh, presentations to various community partners and so on so it's a um, unique feature of our program that we have these events uh, always as i say run in, in the beginning of the uh, winter term um, and I think that it, it's something that we're proud of as a particular feature uh, of the way we uh, engage in co collaborative activity. And one of the other objectives is that, uh, uh, is, uh, or one of the other reasons we have this, is we recognize the importance of different types of collaboration and different types of, of working with different groups and so on. Uh, and so this is an opportunity to learn about how to best work in teams. Uh, for students to experience working in teams which you don't necessarily control the makeup of um, and allow uh, students to, to get that experience. So this year we also added a feature where we provided some, some um, education and training around how to work effectively in teams, so tools for teamwork for students to use uh, in the whole process. And from my observations and from what I've heard, uh, it sounded as if these were, were quite useful to teams in the way uh, the event rolled out. So as you can see on the screen now, we have the, the brief introduction and we have the list of 10 competitions. And the, the uh, event today, we're going to ask one instructor who supported each of these competitions to speak uh, for just a couple of minutes, up to five minutes on the competition, on some of the ideas that came through in that competition and uh, so, uh, show some of the work that students did. So we're gonna start off um, with the uh, carbon positive uh, affordable housing competition. Uh, and uh, Helen Strupp, uh, was one of the instructors who supported that competition. So I'm going to invite Helen to say a few words about that competition. 
Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Um, so the students in our uh, competition were looking at carbon positive affordable housing. Um, and for those of you looking at the title and getting a little bit confused, my first reaction was exactly the same. Um, what is carbon positive housing? Aren't we supposed to be reducing carbon? Uh, well, actually what they mean when they're saying carbon positive housing in this case is that they mean reducing carbon below zero. So uh, your house is not zero carbon. You are adding in you know, either sequestration or renewable energy that's going to feed back to the grid. Now, the big challenge for students with this competition was that uh, there were very vague guidelines on, on what needed to be uh, put into the design, uh, what they should solve in general. Really, they were just asked to talk about or to come up with a design that addresses um, massive, the massive energy use and GHG emissions from buildings, as well as you know housing stability challenges and how those may be aggravated by climate change. Uh, so what we saw with the students is that they came up with these really, really varied ideas uh, with a huge focus on really the people who are going to be living in the homes and the situations in which they're going to be located. So, you know, we had people like the uh, WM housing team who were looking at opportunities to build, you know, stick um, houses that are on stilts uh, so that they can, you know, not have challenges with flooding in uh, coastal regions, say in Mumbai. Mumbai. Um, you know, we also had our Pando Eco Village team who were again looking at low income coastal regions and all the different fun stuff we can integrate in that way. Uh, on a totally different vein, you know, our other teams were looking at things like building apartment buildings and, and how we can build a carbon positive apartment building uh, that creates, you know, community and a place people like to live. Um, infill was another big topic that they looked at, uh, you know, laneway housing, how we can make laneway housing more attractive. Uh, and of course, you know, modular solutions, whether they're in a parking lot, so taking up just the space of one parking space, uh, a movable home, uh, or whether, you know, they're uh, on, say, Toronto Island and dealing with different adverse effects there. Uh, so there was a huge diversity in the solutions that came out of this, but I think really what's common across all of them is how the student teams focused on, um, you know, providing these intangible uh, benefits that housing should bring, right? So not just the carbon aspects, not just the energy aspects or the fact that it's housing, uh, but integrating in these community areas, whether it's gardens or um, shared facilities between, uh, to, between households uh, to bring people together and really create you know, a better sense of community and a good environment for everyone. So that's, that's all I've got to say on that one. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Helen, and thanks for going first. Uh, and also thanks to Alison Evans for supporting that, uh, that competition. Uh, the, the next competition that we're going to talk about is the uh, Urban Chair, Rethinking the Street Furniture, which was supported by Julia Jamrozic and uh, also Isabella uh, Trinidad. So I'm going to invite Julia to say a few words about this competition. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, like you said, this competition was supported by myself and Isabella Trinidad. We also had Isabel Arboleda as our graduate assistant. Um, and we had eight teams of students, uh, three people per team working uh, with us over those four very intense days. Um, I have to say for me personally, this was uh, the first kind of teaching engagement uh, at, in the department, and it was a very exciting one, uh, very exciting to get um, to know so many students so quickly and to, to work on, on a quite an intense project um, over those four days. Um, so our competition was called Urban Chair 2.0, uh, Rethinking Street Furniture. And it was um, pretty self-explanatory in terms of the title. We were looking at different kinds of street furniture that could be uh, provided in different settings. And um, like Helen's competition, it was also very, very open in terms of the parameters. Um, it could be seating for one, seating for many, it could be in a particular location, or it could be just more broadly considered um, urban furniture. Um, the idea was to uh, to come up with uh, with prototypes that would uh, provide for uh, flexibility, but also provide for a kind of an identity for for different places. 
Um, and so the students really took this on um, and different teams took, you know, different aspects um, to heart more than others. So some were mo motivated really by the idea of flexibility and what would that mean? So different parts moving around on the site, um, aspects of certain things being fi fixed but rotating, um, like the Revolve project you just saw on the screen. Um, others thought a lot about um, interaction and communication. So, um, and how that happens, for example, the, the image on the screen is showing the project that, that worked with sound and how the seats could become a kind of communication device. Um, students were concerned with sustainability, with material use, um, with, uh, with, with mental health, as well as kind of physical well-being um, that could be provided through um, these urban furniture installations. We did have one um, kind of snag happened in the during the four days, which was that we found out that our competition had actually been canceled. Um, and so unfortunately, our students aren't going to be able to um, submit their projects to this particular competition. Uh, but we are hoping that there will be other um, street furniture and um, urban design competitions where they can use their work and and submit it um, and be recognized for for I think the very creative and uh, very kind of uh, human focused uh, projects that that they did. Um, and so I guess just a thank you to the students for for all the great work and um, hope you get a chance to to look at some of the individual entries um, on the website. Thanks very much, Julia. Uh, just to point out that uh, for each competition, we ask graduate students to develop these videos which you're seeing uh, being, being played as we hear about these competitions. So uh, we invite everybody to check those videos out, which are, are a record of, of the process that the teams went through in assembling, uh, in, in doing their work. Um, I also wanted to just comment that it seems that the competitions being canceled is not a rare thing because two of our 10 competitions were canceled uh, at, or just before uh, the launch of the event. So we'll hear about the, another one in a minute. Uh, so I'd like to invite now uh, David uh, Agro to speak a little bit about the bird watching in Chester Meadows competition. Uh, David joined us from, uh, as a friend from, uh, of the department and worked with Marco Polo to support students in this uh, competition. So over to you, David. Hi. Um, so Marco can't be here. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the competition. It's in Chester, England. Uh, there's a bird watching area in uh, what's called the Meadows. It's in the bow of the river. And Chester is an old town. It goes back to, it's got, got, uh, got Roman origins. Uh, it's a fairly popular place. And the competition was set up by a local architecture firm who wanted to um, design a uh, bird watching pavilion. And, and what bird watchers do is they go into these structures so that they're hidden from the birds and they can get quite close to and watch them. So there were six teams and as a practicing architect and environmentalist who's done a lot of work with ecotourism, I was looking forward to seeing how the students would uh, address this project. Um, particularly because these, these people are beginning their careers at a, at a time when there's a huge amount of environmental change at a scale that hasn't been seen before. And many of the solutions to these problems are gonna come out of the design work that they do. Um, Marco and I had a discussion about this and we, we were struck by often, often architecture is used to protect people from nature or keep nature uh, out of people. And, um, you know, the, in the Canadian context, Northrop Fry's garrison mentality is, is an example of that. But these projects don't do that. They uh, are, and it's encouraging that they're trying to develop ideas about how to get people into nature, how to experience and engage with it, uh, and, and also interact with it. All of the students uh, changed the program, was, which was originally for a pavilion, and they broke the pavilions down into uh, smaller components and distributed them across the site. So, uh, not some one group had them all the same and, and other groups had them uh, different. Um, and each of these, each group picked ways to engage with specific aspects of the site or long views uh, over in the, in, the, in the city of Chester. Um, 
the, uh, the projects made a concerted effort to uh, have a low impact form of construction, uh, which would cause uh, minimal damage. The, um, there is a, one aspect of the site is that it's seasonally flooded. And in some years that's, that flooding can be quite significant. And while all the projects made allowances for that, uh, there didn't seem to be aware, an awareness of the power of the floods uh, and, and how destructive they could be. And uh, Martin and Mar uh, Marco and I commented on the, you know, how this re reflects the, 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 sorry, the hubris of, uh, that's not really right, the word, the right word, but the hubris of architecture in, in the face of the uh, power of nature. Um, there was a really nice selection of materials used to express ideas of lightness and solidity screening and transparency used was wood was used in many different ways uh, but interestingly it wasn't considered for foundations uh, and as Marco mentioned Venice was built on wood piers so you know there was a there's a kind of um, in, inventiveness with wood which might might have been missed there an inspired material choice was to use wool fabric which was locally available and uh, used on one project as a curtain around the pavilion, which would move with the wind and, uh, and, and uh, provide nesting materials for birds. Um, many of the pavilions provided shelters that are, or nesting capacities for birds, underscoring a desire to, for the structures to give back to nature. A lot of the people talked about this while, while they were doing their work. Um, and a couple of the pavilions collected water from the roof to provide bathing or drinking opportunities for, for birds, which would of course uh, draw them closer to the pavilions. Uh, and then one last uh, comment, uh, I guess with, from me, because uh, representation is always so important in, a, in practice, uh, all, the, all the presentations were really, really strong. Um, and Marco and I had a discussion about some of the, um, some of the immediacy on the whiteboards so of the sketches di didn't seem to translate through in, in, into some of the uh, in, into some of the computer renderings, which was which, which was a shame because there were really lot there were a lot of really strong ideas in the in developing site planning and that kind of thing. But anyway, thank you uh, very much. It was really nicely done work. Thanks very much, David, and thanks for supporting the students and participating in the event. It's great to have practitioners come in and work with our students. Um, next, I'd like to move to the future home. So you'll see, notice that there are several competitions which focus on different aspects of the future of, of living and homes uh, and housing, and this is uh, one of these. And um, I'd like to invite Cheryl uh, to speak about this one, Cheryl Atkinson. Thanks, Mark. Um, I worked on this competition with the students with uh, Daniel Hall, architect from, from Kitchener, and Maria Kordmashidi, who teaches at Ryerson. Um, they're similar to the carbon positive home uh, competition. This one kind of went that way. It was a very open competition um, designed or set up by uh, a private architecture firm from um, uh, Latvia, I think, uh, or the Ukraine, sorry. And um, you could enter the competition and paying your fees in, uh, in rupees. So it was uh, a slightly unclear competition who was running it and, and, and why and what the objectives were. Um, it was pretty open-ended. Uh, all they asked for was, uh, something that was elegant, simple, and investigated ways of living uh, in the context of climate change and um, you know, the, the various housing crises that we're, we're finding ourselves in right now. So um, we decided to help our students out by giving them a site and, and some context. And so we decided to work on laneway housing or uh, garden suite housing. So to address a, a housing issue in Toronto that was a bit more specific. So while there wasn't specific sites for the projects, they used that as a template and looked a little bit at what the parameters were of um, that type of housing. 
So the innovations that they looked at were challenging some of the conventional heights that um, Toronto is looking at in terms of um, laneway housing. This project was challenging it in a big way and, and looking at a site actually close to Ryerson that was more of a um, institutional site. There's a diagram of uh, somebody looking at the implications of multiple laneway houses at higher density and height. Uh, students looked at modularity, uh, prefabrication, different types of tenure, um, whether it was co-housing or multi-generational housing. Um, so they were really trying, oh, bio-based materials to recycled materials. The one on the far right is looking at, uh, was inspired by the Lendiger group and some of their ex explorations of um, repurposed brick. So they really looked at the project in uh, a, a huge variety of ways and, and layered all the issues that we're facing right now with um, uh, affordability and uh, lack of space and, um, and trying to build with more um, healthy and bio-based materials. So um, lots of creativity and uh, exploration and it was a fun project to work on. So that's all I've got to say for now. Thanks. Thanks very much, Joe. And, and uh, thanks to Daniel and Maria for helping out mm -hmm. as well. Um, so the next competition is a, a slightly different one from uh, which was looking at the port of Beirut. And I'd like to invite George Kapelos uh, and uh, Harold Gendi to speak about uh, this particular competition. Thank you, Mark. And uh, Nohair um, and I work very closely together and I'm pleased that she's here with me. Um, as you all may know, in 2020, an explosion rocked the port of Beirut and impacted the surrounding area. It was a very critical moment in the history of the city, and we saw it as a chance to perhaps reconsider and reevaluate what this port really meant. Um, and so the question of scale was, I think, the key issue here. And um, I, I would like to uh, ask uh, Nohair to talk a little about our, our motto of the port and why we chose that motto to uh, begin our students' work. Thank you, George. Um, so the, the site of the competition lies in the port of Beirut, which is part, it's actually the heart of the historical city and had a great significance for the city. And we thought that the, the, the site uh, meant a lot to the adjacent community, which was like heavily impacted by the explosion, as well as the whole city of Beirut, where open public spaces are not really uh, available. So we thought of a theme or a motto that would be overarching the whole uh, project and we called it bring the port to the people and bring the people to the port uh, as a way to um, think of the site as a, uh, an opportunity or a place back for the people who are heavily impacted, specifically the um, very poor uh, neighborhoods uh, adjacent to the site, as well as for the whole context of the city of Beirut. So in, in the context of this competition, we surprised the students by telling them that we would divide the port into five distinct areas. And at the same time, we also gave the students uh, uh, distinct topics to investigate because we built, we believed that it was not only important for them to look at it, the competition on a site specific basis, but through various lenses. So there were lenses such as habitation, uh, infrastructure. Um, I think the other one was um, um, sustainability and public public use. So, so each of the students at one point had to deal with these topics, and then they had to come back to teams and bring those topics into the various uh, aspects of their of their um, their design work. Uh, so there was a lot of discussion about housing. We also made the point clear that we believe that the port should be entirely 
used as opposed to continue to be partly a, uh, a place which would have container shipping in it. So, so it, was, it was an opportunity for the students to consider issues as well as to consider the way that they would uh, weave those issues together. And they also were made aware of issues that are taking place already now in Beirut by uh, NGOs who are working with uh, local groups to, uh, to repair the damage of the port. Um, so we, we talked about the political con context of Beirut, which I think is, is, was on everybody's mind. And we also encouraged at the end of the day for the students to, um, to perhaps enter the competition. Now, Eric, did you want to talk something about some of the issues that each of the groups uh, encountered? Yeah, um, so yeah, in addition to that overarching theme, we found that each group like found a, a place or a, a concept on which they were able to develop uh, their projects. So the first group was minded by uh, um, sustainable living, and they considered urban farming, uh, recycling of water, uh, renewable energy, which was a big issue after studying the situation in Beirut city. And uh, the second group, which had the silo or the place of the explosion, uh, they were thinking of the concept of um, the memory uh, and how they could um, commemorate this event using uh, artwork and uh, establishing a, an art gallery in the silo to um, yeah, here, here it is, uh, and a place to contemplate. Um, the third group actually uh, thought of how this site could be uh, reconnected to the city and considering street life. So uh, a series of open spaces was uh, thought of. Um, and then we had the fourth group uh, this, uh, thinking of the open public space as an expression of freedom. And also through their research, they found that in the city of Beirut, it was, you needed actually a written permission so that you, in order to have an event or go to a public space. So they thought that this, the fact that having an open space without permission is an expression of freedom. And they um, investigated that in their open space. And the last group was, um, ending uh, the site with a positive note with celebration. So having an, a big open public space meant for celebrating all those initiatives that took place with the um, event. So not looking at this memory as a, in, an, in a negative way. So these were basically the five uh, main themes under, um, uh, on which the five project developed. And just to conclude, we, we were very excited to discover that a number of the students were of Lebanese origins or came from the Middle East and knew this city very well. So they also brought to this project their own personal experiences and their own sort of ambitions for this part of the world, which I think made it a very rich opportunity for them to engage in this competition. So um, you can see the results here on the screen and we're encouraging them to, to pursue this uh, entry into this competition uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nohar and uh, George, uh, for taking this on a uh, very different scale of competition and work than some of the other ones that we've seen, which is really interesting. Um, also, we have uh, the next competition is one of two that we have, which also a slightly different approach because they focus specifically on a, a particular technology or material uh, approach. So the next competition is the uh, uh, Timber, uh, you know, 2022 Timber competition. Uh, and uh, Will Galloway is going to tell us a little bit about that competition. Uh, hello. Okay. Um, first of all, I have to say it's pretty cool that they made these videos. I didn't realize that was going on. They're, they're really nice, actually. Um, it, it's cool to see that the students, even though they're um, working remotely, actually were engaging so much. Um, as far as the, the competition goes, I, I will... Um, I think I'll, I'll probably speak to my bias a, a little bit uh, in that, although it's a timber competition and you'd almost think that that would mean, you know, it's, it's going to be all about how wooden pieces come together and, and it's gonna be perhaps something extremely technical. Um, the actual assignment for the competition ends up being a uh, quite ambitious urban planning project. Uh, and so the, the students are being asked to 
uh, engage with community. Uh, they're being asked to respond to uh, social issues. Uh, the project itself is in um, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in a downtown community. Uh, and, and so they're asked to connect to that community uh, and they're asked to um, connect to a subway system that exists as well in, in the site adjacent to the, the actual project site. And so they have to do all of this. And then on top of that, do something with wood, um, which is quite a lot to do. And, and I think they're uh, quite impressive for having being able to take on all of that uh, as, as well, uh, you know, all at the same time. So it becomes this big synth synthesis project um, where they're uh, exploring timber as a material. Uh, and then the timber has to somehow express that ambition and take on uh, all of those uh, ambitions. Uh, and so you, you can mostly see timber being used, not just as a, you know, in the sort of technical way as, as a material that has these uh, sort of new properties that we're all learning about in, in terms of making big wooden buildings, uh, but also using them in, in a way that they uh, engage with community and extend out you know, beyond the site, uh, which I thought was a, a pretty interesting thing to do. And all, all of the students took that on really well. Um, you can also see some, some uh, technical solutions in there. I, you might notice one of the projects, for example, is making use of um, transparent wood, which is a kind of avant-garde and, and new material. Uh, and, and that came out pretty interesting. Um, so the video has ended, which I, I don't think means I have to shut up, but I, I think I will anyways, because I think you can see uh, in the projects themselves when you look at the website. So, so ble please check them out. Uh, there, there's some pretty cool projects for such a short time period. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and Paul uh, Floker was the other faculty member who is supporting that competition. I would just like to remind everybody, those of you who don't remember, who don't know, this was a four day event. And in fact, really more like three and a half days by the time we got going. So all this work was created in a very short and intensive time. The other thing I wanted to mention just quickly since uh, uh, Will brought it up, the videos were created by five graduate students. So each graduate student uh, had two competitions to look after and they supported the students, helped with the work, uh, acted as additional instructors, and at the same time collected the uh, content to put these, uh, these um, videos together. So thanks very much to Jeanette, uh, Gabriel, uh, Kirsten, Alex, and Isabel for, for putting those together. So the next competition is the Mextropoli uh, Pavilion, uh, which uh, was supported by uh, Tony Kuna, uh, Joey Giamo, and Baruch Zoman. And Tony's going to tell us a bit about this one. Hey everyone. Uh, I guess it's just a few short informal words. Um, it was very much a pleasure working with the students on this project. Um, the overall sort of uh, uh, ideology of the sort of brief was uh, very vague. Um, essentially, the students were tasked with uh, preparing a pavilion proposal um, that would be part of a, an international festival of architecture in Mexico City that responded to various socioeconomic and cultural uh, uh, sort of contexts um, that, uh, so it was incredibly open-ended, uh, to be honest. Um, there was no site, uh, there was no program. Um, other than uh, to sort of stimulate engagement and interaction, which uh, in a very odd way at the beginning of the project, um, we saw as a challenge, but uh, was quickly embraced by the students to become uh, more of an opportunity. Uh, it was really neat to see how the students sort of uh, engaged the project at different levels, understanding uh, sort of, I mean, what is interaction? Uh, what is uh, how what what are these sort of um, items that they're responding to in this socioeconomic context? Um, so obviously, uh, I can speak from experience uh, working through collaborative exercise. Uh, you always sort of dial down into the site and try to respond accordingly. Um, so it was almost a, a refreshing liberation from uh, from sort of being very site specific and sort of understanding how this uh, response could. Uh, could be applied to a variety of different situations. Um, and so, I mean, of the five or six different groups, uh, I mean, every single one of them came up with something incredibly unique. 
Um, there were, I, of course, a ton of iteration. There was a ton of iteration over the, uh, the four or five days that the students were working on it. And I'm absolutely amazed by what was able, what was generated. I mean, I'm going to state the obvious here, but um, I mean, it's hard enough working as a group of, of students in person, but uh, doing this over Zoom and coming up with a cohesive approach and a series of boards that absolutely make sense um, and are graphically cohesive. I mean, um, and actually uh, are, uh, have a common thread among them. Uh, I mean, kudos to everybody that, that put these together. Um, I encourage every one of the students to uh, continue to refine their proposals and make their submission, uh, make, actually make a submission to the, com to the competition. It's um, uh, every, every proposal has its strong suits. Um, I, I don't think there is any glaring weaknesses. Um, so it, thank you for, in, for involving me in it. But uh, at the same time, I just want to give a, a, a commendation to every single buddy, every, every single student that was a part of it. Uh, I don't really have much else to say, but um, great work. And I mean, uh, seeing all the other proposals here uh, in, in for the first time, I mean, it sounds like that's the case across the board. Thanks very much, Tony. And uh, thanks for coming back uh, as a graduate from our program to, to help support our younger students. Uh, the next competition is the uh, Mies Memorial Library uh, competition. And this was supported by Carlo Parente and John Serkler. And Carlo's here to say a few words about this one. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'll also just note that Gabriel Garofalo was our graduate student representative. So this was a unique competition in that not only was the physical context important, but also the historical context incredibly paramount from the standpoint of who the building was for, uh, where it is, and what it is meant to do. Um, this was a building being designed to celebrate the work of Mies van der Rohe, one of the most influential 20th century architects. So no pressure on the students. Um, the, the impetus of the competition was, in essence, a library that embodied Mies. So once again, no pressure. Um, part of the competition prompt noted that the Mies drawings, letters, articles, and artifacts, um, they're currently pr preserved across various institutions, such as the MoMA, the Art Institute in Chicago, and even uh, the CCA here in uh, Canada and Montreal. Um, so the prompt was elaborating in a hypothetical scenario where there was a plan to consolidate all of Mies's collections under one roof on the Illinois Institute of Technology campus in Chicago. Um, the campus that Mies had not only designed the master plan for, but he also designed a significant number of buildings, including Crown Hall, which serves as the College of Architecture. Not only did Mies design the architecture buildings, but he also designed the architecture curr curriculum at the school for which he was the director for 20 years. So again, no pressure on the students at all. Um, the students were given three sites to choose from on the campus, all prominent and important for their own unique reasons, and all of them had some relationship to the architecture college. Um, so how did our students go about engaging in this competition? They started by familiarizing themselves with the work and writings of Mies, the campus. All of this was done in a really short time frame. Um, in developing their projects, the students used this information and engaged some of the spatial, structural, geometrical, material ideas that make up the Miesian language, the grid, the pinwheel, allowing volumes to slip past each other, the spatial consequence of structure, the open plan. Um, so these are all things that the students picked up on and used in their projects. Um, you can't create a project about Mies without really looking at his aphorisms. Um, one of the favorites, one of my favorites that the students picked up on was architecture is the will of an epic translated into space. Um, so a uh, group five um, that uh, whose project is called the Miesian Bar took this to heart and attempted to define what this aphorism means today. Once again, not only uh, not an easy task for a really short charrette, um, the work of this team looked at introducing what would the camp what would be the campus's first mass timber structure um, this horizontal elevated bar that they designed would hover just north of crown hall and spatially would provide freedom of movement it was a lightness that aimed 
once again, to be a 21st century translation of Mises' ideas. Um, another group, Group One, took a different approach. Um, their project called The Lattice uh, looked at the notion that the campus was actually an extension of the collections and attempted to use the building as almost a device whose apertures would capture various moments and details that surrounded the Miesian buildings. Uh, they noted in the, their write-up that, um, I'll just quote here, our interpretation of Mies, the Mies, Mies Memorial Library is one that emphasizes its surroundings rather than just the building itself. Um, so what, what I thought was really interesting about the way that the students worked is that they also picked up on some of the representational techniques employed by Mies as many chose to use photo collages to tell their stories and tell, to tell the story of the projects. Um, and I think this was interesting because they connected their own drawing techniques and made reference to the curriculum where there's a visual training program at uh, IIT that emphasizes this, this notion of the collage and materiality. So once again, a lot to take on and a lot to absorb in a short, short amount of time. And I think the students had fun and learned a lot and it was uh, really fun to be part of as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, so the, the next competition is uh, the Healthy Housing Competition. Uh, and this is one that I supported together with uh, Terry Peters. Uh, and this was the other competition which we had found just before we started actually had been uh, cancelled. So the competition wasn't going ahead, but we, we were able to turn it around and focus on affordable housing in Vancouver, which was a separate competition that we hadn't originally planned to include, uh, but to focus the students thinking still on healthy uh, health issues in housing, but uh, and combine the issues of affordable housing and health. Uh, which in some ways complicated the issues for them because it raises all sorts of additional problems. Um, so the students focused on initially really thinking about what does health uh, mean and uh, in, a, in an affordable context uh, and how does uh, health relate to quality of life, to well-being, uh, to community? Is health just an individual issue or is it a community issue? Do we have, or it was the focus on just uh, healthy apartments in, in, a, in a building or is it about building health within a community in a wider context? So see, these were some of the earlier discussions that we had. Uh, also, uh, the, the role of nature in, to, in providing for health. And so bringing in concepts like uh, 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 biophilia and the, the, the idea of E.L. Wilson and, and that we all relate to, to, to bio, uh, the, the biological world around us and that make, improves on our health. Um, uh, and other aspects of uh, biomimicry and bringing in natural components into the build, into the building, as well as the more traditional architectural issues of things like light and ventilation and so on, and, and their relationship to to health and, and a healthy, uh, affordable environment, uh, a healthy environment in an affordable housing uh, context. Uh, students were also very interested in materiality and aware of issues around uh, uh, the impact the materials have on our health. The, uh, emissions that come from materials, uh, but also the sort of tactile nature and the uh, uh, potential for materials and plants to absorb certain pollutants uh, and how they create different visual and, and acoustic environments uh, and, uh, and the relationship of those to health. So uh, quite a lot of, uh, a wide range of issues were, were discussed. Um, students were also interested in, in how these buildings could be built in a way that they can uh, address affordability. So they did, looked uh, at things like prefabrication and modularity uh, as a way of uh, creating the buildings for uh, creating uh, for maintaining affordability, but uh, creating uh, healthy environments. Uh, a number of different sites were looked at. So sites were looked at in relation to uh, the natural context and what the sites could provide for nat uh, from nature, but also for things like capturing view, capturing uh, uh, sunlight, capturing uh, uh, air, air movement and so on. So principally the sites were, uh, well, the sites were in Vancouver. Uh, and just as a couple of examples, if we look at group three, the Renfrew Gardens Villa site, um, that this group was looking at aspects of uh, mid, the missing middle and trying to find solutions for tight urban sites, uh, and yet still provide uh, a quality of life, uh, uh, the type of building that would actually uh, engage with um, 
allowing people to, to have the benefit of outdoor space, to improve their quality of life, community spaces. You know, there were discussions about what type of uh, community facilities people would want to see in their uh, in a project of this kind. Whether it would be you know coffee shops and restaurants and things like that, or um, uh, farmers markets uh, and other things, uh, other features that might bring health in and, and gymnasiums for, for maintaining physical health and so on. Um, another project which uh, I wanted to just mention is the uh, G5 project, um, which uh, was looking at the infill housing on an existing car parking lot. So this was a car parking lot that serves a general hospital uh, in Vancouver, and they were looking at how to add uh, density to this uh, two or three storey parking uh, structure, uh, which would then uh, add housing, which could be used in association with the hospital to provide both uh, a cheaper or affordable housing for hospital workers and also housing for those that were visiting um, patients that were staying in the hospital that needed uh, long, long stays. So various different aspects on affordable housing and on health uh, interaction with affordable housing, uh, which really led to a, a, a wide range of different responses. Uh, I think I'll stop there and, uh, and I invite you to look at the different uh, designs, uh, but I think it, the competition uh, and the, the interaction between these two areas of uh, health and affordability really raised some interesting questions about uh, priorities and about how to, um, uh, uh, the, the issue, the, the notion that you know, some, something like healthy housing is e easier to provide when you have uh, lots of money and you can spend your money on all the types of uh, um, various features and resources that might be associated with a healthy environment, but become much more challenging in an affordable housing context. Uh, so I'll stop there and uh, our final competition uh, was uh, the Canadian Institute of Steel Construction. So it's another competition focusing around uh, a particular material. And this was uh, supported by Vince Kui, Essan, uh, and um, uh, Yuri Lestrician, um, who were, uh, worked with a, quite a large group of students that were working on this competition. And there was no pressure on the students here, uh, despite the fact that you know, we have a history of winning this competition in the past few years and doing very well. So I'm sure Vince didn't put any pressure on them on, on that respect. I thought we were going to be all nice about this at this. I thought this was formal. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Mark, with that introduction. So again, I, I, this the projects you're going to see here could not have been made possible certainly without the students, but of course with the contributions of Professor Lissian and uh, Professor Azar. So I, I thought it would be important to note that uh, though this is the Canadian Institute Steel Construction Steel Bridge Competition, a bridge uh, to a view, a lot of uh, people would see this as an engineering competition, which tends to focus on how does one execute. Um, and you'll see in these examples, there was a preoccupation with architecture students asking, what can we do and why, right? Um, so there were four major objectives in the design proposal. Uh, the first was, of course, uh, in the brief to span between two sites and establish a meaningful connection between them. Um, also, second point, draw attention and become a symbol linking uh, the origin and that destination. Third point was to encourage and uh, basically discover a, some sort of new perspective and to pause and uh, have a view to some sort of uh, intermediate space. And of course, the fourth component was really to ensure that there was a, a method of establishing some sort of knowledge from the site. And the students had all these kind of components in, in their brief, but they were able to also integrate things like platforms, uh, urban furnishings, signage, and of course, lighting. Now, the, when you look at these projects as they're being developed, you'll take note that it wasn't just simply making whimsical forms. They actually had some significant engineering judging criteria to address, uh, not only in terms of aesthetics and ingenuity, but of course, uh, components pertaining to feasibility and of course, obviously the uh, structural use, uh, the use of structural steel. Now, as, as we watch this, these videos, you're gonna see that these bridges come about in very uh, different conditions. You'll see that they range from uh, huge spans in the urban cores through to uh, say very uh, almost science fiction spans across entire uh, chasms. So if, if you really want to see uh, really examples of how students start questioning the why and what, you know, we can start with the more conventional approach uh, that you see in say, 
urban conditions, like in, say, group five, the crossing times uh, proposal, which is basically a, a permutation of one of those uh, plus 15 bridges that you typically find in Calgary. However, in this case, uh, these students put it in Toronto. And again, it's just bridging buildings because, God forbid, it's really cold in Toronto. Um, so we have a protected bridge that establishes a really interesting connection between uh, two conditions uh, in, in the urban core. But as I said before, our students always ask why. So instead of just simply having a point A to point B bridge, uh, if we were to go to another bridge that actually spans into nature, we could take a look at Group 2's project uh, entitled Mystic. And in this case, they actually made a bit of a flux capacitor kind of form where you have three different points of contact in the middle of uh, what is a big chasm. And um, not only were they able to kind of address how structurally this was possible, but they actually decided to take an extra challenge and uh, throw in extra loads, like how do you deal with uh, connections on different uh, conditions, and also how do you ensure that you don't cut down really, really tall trees. So you'll notice that in this particular design, a tree isn't planted in the middle of the bridge, a tree actually comes right through the center of this bridge. So again, the students are pushing the boundaries and asking why and, and why not. Um, and the, the, the final project that really epitomizes this is, of course, uh, Group 9's project, uh, the Big Tub Bends project, which uh, shows a, a bridge over water, but also flat out just going into water. And again, that is a, where, where you see our students are able to creatively, you know, look at that project brief and say, how do we ensure that we have that type of connection between um, the origin points and then the destination and also make sure that there's a relationship to site and provide interesting views. So you can see the technical resolutions there, but as you scroll down, you'll also see that there's a lot of effort put into not only how the structure with the steel works, but also how do you ensure that this can be a great viewing uh, platform, not only above the surface of the water, but also below. So again, that just kind of, I, I should really emphasize the fact that I know I'm, I'm a bit of the anchor on all these competitions, but I just want to say that for this competition, and I think it speaks to many of the other competitions. In this competition, we had students doing this in less than four days uh, with, within just one single course, and it was pretty much all undergrads. If I put things in perspective, this same competition is entered by grads, students from around the country, as well as you know, upper year students. Uh, in many of these instances, other institutions make this a core uh, component of one or maybe even two courses, right? And at the same time, those courses, they don't span three days. They don't span even 30 days. They span four months. So again, this is kind of what epitomizes how good our students are. And this is just, if this is what our kids produce, our students produce in three and a half days, man, you can imagine what they do if they were to just spend a little bit more time tweaking it up and submit it to win these competitions. I'll pass it off to Mark. Thanks very much, uh, Vince. And that's a great way to finish. Uh, and to remind students that these are, uh, you've done a lot of good work here and follow up and uh, finish it off and get it submitted to the, very, to the different competitions. We strongly encourage you to do that and we'll help you do that uh, if, uh, if you need help. Um, so we've been through all the competitions, uh, so we can wrap up. I just wanted to wrap up, first of all, by thanking all the speakers today, thanking everybody to, uh, for taking part and giving us a summary. Uh, I'd like to thank particularly those from outside Ryerson that joined us to help make this happen. Um, and um, to thank uh, the staff, Alex, and for putting together the digital exhibition, and Leo for helping, uh, for getting this event going, uh, organized, and Bridget for the uh, marketing and so on. Uh, and um, in particular, I'd like to uh, thank all the students for all the work they did during that week uh, and congratulate you for, for all the work you've done. And finally, um, just to uh, mention that Vince and I worked on this together to put it all together. So thanks to Vince for your help with, with putting all this, uh, making this happen. Um, and we, uh, we look forward to and invite everybody back to uh, the collaborative exercise from 2023, which will be happening in a year's time. Um, and who knows what it'll look like, but uh, hope, uh, I'm sure we'll get uh, some interesting work again and we can celebrate that at that time. So thanks very much, everybody. I encourage everybody to go and check out the website more carefully, have a look at these uh, projects, and um, 
uh, and enjoy what you can, uh, the, the work the students have done. Uh, and good night.